All right, family, let's go ahead and open our Bibles up today. And I want you to open up first to the book of Psalms, chapter 85. From the beginning of time, God desired to walk with us, and he desired to talk with us. He desired to communicate and share who he was with us, and he desired for us to talk with him. Dialogue. See, we're made in his image. When you read, beginning at Genesis, you read throughout the Old Testament where God Almighty is having dialogue with people. It's amazing. I think about young Samuel as a prophet that's hearing the voice of the Lord as the Lord was calling him by name. How would you like that tonight when you're laying down in bed? Just to hear God just call out your name. Would you do like Samuel? Would you go, did someone leave the TV on? Is there a dog barking? Is, 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 is my wife talking in her sleep? What's, what's, what's going on here? We see throughout Scripture where God does these supernatural things, and it's all about relationship and intimacy. You hear people today in their praise reports going, well, God told me. God said this. Now, for some of you, you hear something like that, and you go, that's weird. They're one of those. Okay, God's talking to them. And some of you go, I get it. I know what that means to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, the question is, where are you this morning in your capacity to hear God talk to you? Do you hear him? Do you take the time to even listen? See, a lot of us, we spend a lot of time talking more about the consumer Christianity. You know, I need to get from God, and I'm like talking and asking and supplementing, and Lord, I need, but we don't take the time to say, Lord, speak to me. I'm just here, and I'm silent, and I'm still, and I'm waiting for you to talk to me. Now, some of you here today, maybe you've tried that. Maybe you've you've waited on the Lord, but just nothing's happened. I have a friend of mine who says, yeah, I, I, I know people say God talked to him. I tried that once, but I, I don't believe that. I think that was back in the Old Testament, and I think that was the New Testament, but I don't think God talks to us. I, I, we have the Bible. God's talking to me. You know, so why do I need anything else? What you're going to hear this morning is going to challenge you, some of you more than others. I'm going to ask you, man, open your heart. Open your mind to possibly that you're stuck, that maybe you're not hearing God as much as he wants you to hear him. And there's some type of lie, there's some type of stronghold in your mind that's tripping you up from hearing him like Samuel did, from walking and talking with him like Adam did, where all of a sudden God appeared to Saul and Paul and and actually Jesus himself discipled Paul in the desert. Now, I'm not trying to say I think Jesus is going to appear in physical form. I think the next time we see him, well, we'll be in the clouds, amen, right? But he's, he's all about talking to us. And so what I want to do before we dive into John chapter 16, which is all about the voice of the Lord, I want to give you a foundational understanding of what it means to hear the voice of God. Because, see, understand this, the disciples, the apostles, they had an excellent foundation of what it meant to hear the voice of God. They were hearing him. They were obeying him. They were walking with him. Let's take a look. I'm going to have these scriptures up on the screen for those of you that might not be able to kind of turn quick enough, but I want you to go ahead and begin with me looking at Psalms 85, and we'll skip through several of these scriptures here. 
Look with me at verse 7. Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near and those who fear him, that the glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Now turn with me over to Isaiah chapter 30. Look with me at verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. You hear that? God's waiting on you. He wants you to wait on him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Now turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Look with me at verse 11. Here we see the Lord addresses Elijah after he's called fire down from heaven, destroying the prophets of Baal, and he runs in fear from Jezebel. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore to the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing, Elijah? I know we're playing Bible hopscotch. Bear with me here. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets... That's what we just read, didn't we? Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Stop there. So what we're reading here is from the beginning of time, God has spoken to man in various times and various ways audible speaking, whether that is something they were hearing in their minds or someone around them, because we know Eli couldn't hear the voice that Samuel heard. I don't know what you're talking about, right? But Samuel could hear it. We know, no, no doubt, Adam heard an audible voice of the Lord as he was walking in the garden. He even heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. 
So in various times, various ways. But here the writer of Hebrews says, but in these last days, God has chosen to spoke to us through his son, who is the word of God. That's why in the Genesis it says, and the Lord said, the word. The word has always been speaking. In these last days, the word became flesh. We read about that in Isaiah 85, or Psalms 85, I don't know if you caught that, but it talks about that's the coming of the Lord to speak to his people and rescue his people. And life would come out from the midst of the earth. Hallelujah. So God is speaking to us, and I know all of us have a desire to want to hear God. And we're trying in different ways to hear him, and, and we believe that the primary way we hear God is his word. The question is, what is the word of God? What is it? Is it the Bible? Yes, no. We got some different ideas here. Interesting. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16, who can, who can cite 2 Timothy 3.16 for me? Who knows that scripture? Lay it on me. Right? Training and righteousness, yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah. So we just read that all Scripture is inspired, or God breathed in another version. God breathed all Scripture. Now, what Scripture was the writer of, was Paul talking about when he wrote that to Timothy? What Scripture was he talking about? The Old Testament. We didn't talk about the New Testament, was he? It wasn't written. We're going somewhere, huh? How many times have we taken that scripture and go, yeah, that's right. Well, he's not talking about the New Testament. And and he says all scripture. Well, there's other scriptures besides what we have in our canon of scripture. There's a book of 2 Peter. There's a book of Enoch. There's all kinds of areas of scripture. But, But do we say everything is from him? So the answer is no, we don't. So how do we know what is really from him and what's not? How do we know when God is speaking? How do we know this is God's word? How do you really know? Well, let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Don't call me a heretic yet. Be patient. I promise you, you didn't walk into a cult this morning. If it's your first time here, we're going through the Gospel of John here in Genesis on Wednesdays and Revelation on Saturday night, verse by verse. We love God's Word. Just to calm you down a little bit if you're freaking out. Romans 8, 14, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Wow. So when I'm born again, the Spirit of God lives inside me and talks to who? My spirit. See, you're, you're made of body, soul, and spirit, triune being, just like Almighty God. Let us make man in our own image, right? So you're made in his image. You have a spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. And we read in God's word that you have this companionship, this dialogue with Almighty God that speaks to you and bears witness to you what truth is. That's how we hear God. What is your primary source of hearing God? Because I'm telling you, if it's a book, then you're not worshiping the Word. The Word of God is not a book. The Word of God is a person. He's a person. His name is Jesus. He sent the Holy Spirit to tell you and remind you of everything He has said. You are a walking concordance. 
John said there's not enough room at the end of his gospel for all the things Jesus said. There's all the books of the world. It'd take more than that to say everything that he did. There's more. Here's the thing. Whatever God does say to us will never contradict the canon of Scripture. Never will. If someone comes to me, and I've had this, well, the Lord's speaking to me. I, I hear the voice of God, and God has called me to divorce my husband and marry this guy. Oh, really? God told me. Well, let me tell you what. If it contradicts the word of God, which my spirit bears witness, this is the word of God. I can't tell you. The spirit of God has to tell you this is the word of God. I can't go, I'm telling you this is the word of God. That's meaningless, Okay. You have to bear witness this is the word of God. See, if I'm on a desert island, and without the Holy Spirit, this, this doesn't mean anything. It's like, remember before you got saved, trying to read the Bible? Boring. Like reading Greek or Hebrew, you might as well, because you're not getting anything. But when the Spirit of God comes in you, you go, oh my God. Gosh, I'm a kid in a candy store. This is a big love letter from Dad, and he's telling me he loves me. And my spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that says, truth. Wow. You see what happens? But see, that's why we got so many people going to cemetery, our seminary, right? And they go to all these schools, and they're learning the Bible and this Greek, Greek word, Hebrew word, Aramaic, and they're doing all this study, and they're just like, they're, they're, I like them to like a porcupine, you know? They got many fine points, but you can't get close to them. They're sharp, and there's no comfort, you know what I mean? And they got all this intellect and knowledge, but it's meaningless because they're not walking in the spirit of God as sons of God. We need the Holy Spirit to understand anything that God is saying to us. The Greeks were big on knowledge, and there's a lot of people in the church that are big on knowledge, and they worship a book. I worship the Word of God. I worship Jesus. I follow after Him. And the Holy Spirit came inside of me and bears witness that this is inspired and breathed of God. I trust it. I believe it's Him. Now, because it's been translated so many times, I, I can go, well, if I look at it in a Greek lexicon, I go, well, that's not the right English word. And if you're a student of the Bible, and there's, some, there's some college students in here, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? We got some pastors in here. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you study and you go, wow, you're like, you look at the NIV from the Dead Sea Scrolls and you go, is that even a Bible in that verse? Oh my gosh, that's so way off from the original language, it's ridiculous. But let me tell you what, I believe someone can read a New World's translation from the Jehovah's Witness as corrupt as that is. Well, I wouldn't recommend it. But someone could even read that and get saved. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit isn't corrupted. Amen. He isn't. Tra English translations can veer off and get a little muddy. Holy Spirit never does. So we trust and we rely upon him. But what's happened is we live in a culture today that relies more on a book and our intellect than the spirit of the living God who lives inside all who call in the name of Jesus. And, and let me tell you what, thinking about talking about this this morning, I go, I'm asking for problems, I know. I, believe, I know it, because I know there's some of you that, are, that are, are really shaky with what I'm talking about, and you're thinking, I, I don't know if I can trust this reveal fellowship, what kind of church is it? I, I, I know it sounds weird, it's, but I am telling you, this is revolutionary, this is prophetic, what I'm saying. I believe we live in a culture today that is way off and relying upon our intellect and study and theology than hearing the voice of the Lord. And it's a big cop-out. It really is. Turn with me over to the book of 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to drive this home in a way that you're going to go, bullseye, bullseye, Dave. Wow, that's it, that's it. Look with me. At 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, and you're going to go, boom, that's it. But the anointing which you have received from him, who's the anointing? That's the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit that you've received from him abides in you. You do not need that anyone teach you. But the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it's taught you, you will abide in him. What a verse. You don't need teachers. 
You need the Holy Spirit. Now, is, is he doing away with part of the five-fold ministry in Ephesians about teachers? Not at all. God uses teachers. The, the, the emphasis is saying, what's the priority? What's the combinator? What's the main point? Is we, don't rely, we look for teachers that instruct and educate and disciple to confirm what the Holy Spirit is saying to us because we can think the Spirit of God is saying something to us and we can be wrong because we're flawed and we have a bias and we have agenda and we're good at lying to ourselves. So praise God for the scriptures. Thank you, Father, for inspiring them by your spirit to write these things down with a continuity and a flow and prophecies that confirm this is supernatural and all the things we go, this ain't no normal book. Oh my gosh, this is your heart. This is your mind. You preserve this in a way that only God, you could. So that way, as I'm learning to grow and hearing the voice of God through his presence that abides in me and go, that's my teacher. That's my pastor. That's the one that leads me. I'll listen to other teachers. I'll listen to other pastors as a way of growing and humble myself, submitting myself to authority, being discipled. But I am going to have to confirm everything with the Spirit of God that lives inside me, and I'll find a continuity with the Word of God. And see, a lot of folks aren't doing that because they're afraid of the Holy Spirit. We live in a culture of Christianity today that's moved the Holy Spirit as something as just something religious we say when we baptize Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If we're going to sing about the Trinity, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. But he's Jesus here. Jesus said, I'm sending him as an ambassador of me to lift me up within you and my word up within you. And yet we're not listening to him. We're not having a relationship with him. And we're relying more upon our intellect and our Bible studies and teachers and pastors and things like that than growing in intimacy one-on-one -on -one with God. God wants us going directly to him. I don't want people coming here going, well, I've got to learn the Bible. i got to listen to Pastor Dave. Well, what does Pastor Dave think? I, when people ask me, I like to go, what has the Lord showed you? Don't be Dave-dependent. You're going to be a mess. <laughs> be God-dependent. Now, if you come to me and say, well, Dave, I did pray about it, and this is what the Lord is showing me, and, and I see a contradiction in his word here, then I'm going to go, you're wrong. You're wrong, because God doesn't contradict himself. But it has to start there. Now, with that said, we're going to take a look here at John chapter 16, where Jesus, understand, he's about to leave planet Earth. We've had this incredible last month looking at the upper room and the incredible time of Jesus being a servant to his, his friends and about saying, hey, I'm going to die, but your heart is troubled, but I don't want you to be troubled because I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. How is he going to come to us? Well, we'll read about that. He wants us to bear fruit. And he goes into this whole rap about persecution. We looked at that last week about how times are going to get tough. But he wants to bring comfort and direction in our lives. And this chapter, look with me at the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week and talk about the voice of God. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? Okay. Verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Stop there. Here, Jesus is going, I told you I'm leaving, and you're so overwhelmed and distressed, you're not even focusing on where I'm going and why I'm going. These guys are depressed. I, am, I believe that. They are completely bummed out. They are so bummed out and disillusioned, as we read last night, when they head to the Garden of Gethsemane for prayer, they, they just go into denial and depression and go to sleep. Here Jesus tells them, I'm going to be tortured and murdered, and I'm going away, and they're coming after you next, and they can crash out. What's up with that? Right? They're so disillusioned, they're medicating and just going into denial. They're not focused. They're confused. And, and Jesus is trying to say, I want you to think here. I, 
I, you're not even asking where I'm going. Let me explain this to you. This is to your advantage. This is going to be better. This is going to be better than having me here in a physical form. I'm going to send you a helper or a comforter. Literally, your personal guide. Your personal guide. And he begins to tell them about this personal guide he's going to send to them. He says, he is the helper. The helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Somebody say amen. Amen. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Stop there. So there's a lot more Jesus wanted to say, but he's knowing they don't have the Holy Spirit, that they don't have that inner communion of hearing the voice of God. So there's a lot that's going to go zip right over their head. He goes, but what's going to happen is I'm going to leave, and when the atonement takes place, all of a sudden God can come and dwell in you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You will be a clean zone. You're a leprosy zone now. But let me tell you what, you'll be clean and his presence will come and he's going to come and perform some incredible things. He talks about the Holy Spirit and the function. Before we get into that, I want to tell you something great about God. And and he says it right here. Look with me. In verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you what? The truth. Who else do you know that tells you the truth? Nobody. Not like that. No one tells the truth like God. He is the only one who will never lie to you, will never cheat on you, will never use you, will never abandon you. If he tells you something, baby, you can bank on it. He tells you the truth. And so he wants to emphasize before he explains to them with the Holy Spirit and the guide, he goes, I, I, I'm telling you the truth. This is emphatic. You can, you can, this is not a truth. This is the truth. It's a sure thing. There is no sure thing in this world outside of Jesus. And so he's here to tell you this. He'll go, okay, so this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and you're the only place because you are the truth, Lord. So got it. He says the Holy Spirit's going to come, and the main function he's going to have, number one, is to convict of sin. The Holy Spirit speaks to people, convicting them of sin. How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit convicting of sin or not the Holy Spirit, right? Understand there's only one sin really the Holy Spirit convicts the world of. That's not believing in Jesus Christ. That's what he, it's the first function. He doesn't come to unbelievers and convict them of their smoking, convict them of their fornication, Convict them of their embezzlement. There might be some shame involved there from just a human mindset, but the Holy Spirit's not interested in things. He comes to convict of sin, of messing the mark, of believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so Jesus said, I'm seeing the Holy Spirit, and that's the first thing he's going to do. So if you're an unbeliever here this morning and and pondering, oh, I want to hear the voice of God, I'm hearing the only voice you're going to hear as an unbeliever will be, come to me. Turn from your sin and come and trust Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear the Holy Spirit as an unbeliever trying to speak to you because there's no other conversation to be had with you if you're an unbeliever. There's nothing else to discuss. God speaks to his children. If you're not a child, there is no dialogue and intimacy, but you're hearing one invitation, and that's come to Jesus. So if you're hearing other voices like God's mad at me, you know, or God's really down on me for my sin, this and that, that ain't the voice of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk like that to unbelievers. Christians talk like that to unbelievers. Pharisees talk like that to unbelievers. The Holy Spirit never does. Maybe we need to talk to unbelievers like the Holy Spirit talks to believers. Unbelievers, right? See how voices can be confused? What's that one movie, Russell Crowe, A Beautiful Mind, where the guy heard voices? That's kind of what we walk around like that. We're hearing all kinds of voices. There's only one. There's only one voice to listen to. So how do we know what's God and what's not? Well, his word. We find things confirmed in his word. 
So if we read in the word and we go, wow, he's made it very clear to us what he wants to say to the world is repent and turn to Jesus, then we know what he's saying. So he sent, number one, to convict the world of sin. The Holy Spirit comes as the voice of truth to come as well to convict of righteousness. Hey, that's where it comes into play here as believers in this place. Understand this. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can tell you what is right. There is no humanitarian award for someone here who figures it out on their own. There's only one righteous one. His name is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you to lead and guide you on the things that Jesus would do. See, John said in 1 John 1, 6, he said, anyone who claims to be in Jesus must walk as Jesus walked. I can't know how to walk how Jesus walked unless the Holy Spirit's inside of me leading me in what's righteous. I can't do it. Otherwise, it's just works. So how do I learn to know when it's his voice telling me what's the righteous road to take? Because we're always seeking out God's will, aren't we? We're constantly going, what's your will for my life? I, I want to hear your voice. I, I want to have that direction in my life and know. Well, see, many of us want to have this voice of righteousness and lead and the guide of the Holy Spirit telling us things like, hey, you know what? There's a guy going to be on the street corner on Lake Worth at 441 a day at 4 o'clock, and he's ready to give his life to me, and I want you to go share the gospel with him. His name's Ted. Go share... Got it, Lord. Got it. Would you, would you like that? Would you like to hear God talk to you like that? Does God talk like that still? See, some say no. Some say God doesn't talk like that anymore. We have the canon of Scripture, so I don't need the Holy Spirit to talk to me inside and tell me things. Let me tell you what. The Holy Spirit's still talking and leading in righteousness, His people, and telling you things He wants you to do. He speaks to you through dreams, through visions. I had something happen to me this week. Every week, God's saying something incredible. blows my mind. It's like I had, I had an issue with someone I needed to talk to, and they weren't receiving um, some direction, correction, let's call it what it is. And, and I thought about taking a second party, Matthew 18, to this person because I want to follow protocol in the Word of God to minister to them. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you don't need to call that person. I'm going to tell them to call that person. And, they're gonna, and that next morning, I get a letter at 4 o'clock from that initial person say, so-and-so called me and told me they agreed with what you were talking about, and I didn't even talk to that person. And they're going, I've, I've repented. And I'm sitting there going, this is way cool, God. <laughs> this is way cool. You, I, I hope that wasn't too confusing because I'm trying to keep confidentiality with that. But the point is, it's like God's telling me, you don't need to do that. I got it covered, and I'm going to do that exact thing. And he was leading me and telling me that God, and you know what's so great? It's not so we can go, I'm really spiritual. I am so holy. What would God do without me? I'm so needed in his kingdom. It's not so we can build up pride. It's so we can go, Dad, you love me. You show me things before they happen. Wow, Lord, I've, it's humbling. It's really humbling. Now, you can go, well, that was just a coincidence, Dave. Hey, that's between you and the Lord if you want to call it a coincidence. My spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit, and it rocked my world. Because he's leading. But, so how do we get to that place to where we go, well, you're going to leave. I want to hear God do things like that. It starts by allowing him to lead you in righteousness in the little things. You're hearing people go, the little things this morning. When you're doing something that you know is handing your righteousness away. See, we can't gain righteousness. He is our righteousness. There's nothing we can do, but we can take the righteousness he gives us and we can toss it on the ground like a dirty towel and say, I'd rather not use that, I'd rather not walk in that. And see, when, when you're coming to a situation, for example, say you're sitting in a movie and you're going, oh man, this is really ungodly and I, I really shouldn't be sitting here, but man, I paid nine bucks, I don't want to waste that. You know? And the Holy Spirit's going, you really shouldn't be engaging in this. And you're going... Yeah, I know, but I'm under grace. I'm under grace. And there's this battle going on here where the voice of God is talking to you. 
It's not an audible voice. It's something in your, in your subconscious, or in your conscious mind even, where you're going, I know, yeah, and you're battling, and then you choose to do what you want to do and ignore his voice. And he's talking to you like this, and as soon as you decide, I'm not getting up, I'm not going to rise, I'm going to sit here, all of his voice goes from sounding like this to starting to sound like this, and you can't quite hear him as much, and he's still talking to you, and all of a sudden he starts to talk to you again, and you ignore it, and all of a sudden you can't hear anything. It's all gone. You don't hear him. He's still talking. You're just like Shrek, you know, these big long tubes of wax in your ear that you need to pull out. Because he's still talking to you, but you're just cramming your ears full of lies and your own self-will. The Spirit of God's still bearing witness with you, trying to tell you, get out of there. You're handing over your righteousness that you received by grace and trading it for unrighteousness. And the Holy Spirit's trying to talk to you. But you're not listening. And if you don't start listening to little things like that, I know I shouldn't yell at my wife. I know I should forgive that brother. I know I should forgive, but he's such a jerk. So how can I? I know I shouldn't gossip, but I'm really not gossiping. It's a prayer request. Did you know so-and-so this is going on? I'm just telling you for prayer's sake. So you can hear about it. So don't tell anybody. Oh, I wouldn't tell anybody about that. That's okay. And the Holy Spirit's going, gossip, slander. And you're justifying it. And his voice is getting more dim and more dim. And you're not hearing him talk. And then all of a sudden you're going, man, I want to walk in words of knowledge like Jesus with the woman at the well. And here I have divine appointments. And God, tell me things that are going on. I have this intimate. I want to be like Enoch. Just walk with him and heard him. And Noah that heard him. I want, are you walking by the truth of the spirit of truth and being convicted of the righteousness of Christ in the little things? Because if you're not, don't think about this lofty walk being a Noah or Enoch or Apostle Paul. Because it ain't going to happen. The little things first. Be faithful with the little things, and he'll give you more. Okay? It's just like that with finances. Just be faithful a little bit, he gives you more. It's the same thing with everything. He's looking for us to go, I'm going to be faithful with the little things you told me to do. And, and because what happens is we ignore that, and we go on to the next big thing. Oh, I want a gift of prophecy. I, I want this deep understanding and wisdom. You tell me to ask for wisdom in James. I'm going to ask for wisdom and insight. God's saying, you're, you're still being bitter and not forgiving your brother or your sister when I've led you in righteousness by the voice of my Holy Spirit, and you're not listening you're not abiding. You're not yielding. And so what happens is after a time of living a life like that, Christianity becomes kind of a drag. See, if I had a, whole, if I had a bumper sticker, it'd be Christianity with the Holy Spirit's a drag. You know? Because you can be a Christian without not abiding in the Spirit. You, can, you can't get rid of the Holy Spirit if you're saved. He lives with you. He's stuck with you. <laughs> you know, he's, got, he's, he's not going anywhere. But he's going to be grieved and he's going to be quenched, as the scripture says. So he's still there. He's just grieved and quenched. And you medicate yourself with so much of the flesh, you don't even sense his grief that he's inside you saying, I'm grieved. Wrong direction, wrong road, dead end, cliff, stop. And you keep on doing things to just shut him out and cram the wax deeper and all along praying for God's will in your life and saying, Lord, will you speak to me? Please talk to me, God. I need to hear your voice. How come you don't speak to me? You see what's going on? I'm telling you, this is an epidemic in the church. And we get frustrated. You wonder, how do people turn into Pharisees? How do people that know the scriptures so good, but they don't hear God or commune with him? Because there's so much blatant hypocrisy, the whitewashed tomb syndrome. So much blatant hypocrisy, and it's all hidden on the outside. It looks like we're Christians, and we're right, and we love God, and we lift our hands. How great is our God? You know, we're worshiping, and we're quoting Bible verses. But inside, we're full of all these areas where we've ignored the voice of the Lord saying, walk the righteous path. And all of a sudden, it just becomes a compartmentalized Christianity that is no one wants to look at call attractive, Right? That's what happens. So if we want to hear the voice of God, we have to go back to first base and go, I want to start with the little things, Lord, the things I know you're calling me to do. Separate myself from the things of this world, that, the sin that put you on the cross and, and murdered you, Lord. I don't want to play with the weapon that killed you. I don't want to play with that. If someone murdered your father with a knife, would you want to play with a knife? Would you want to worship the knife? Entertain with the knife? 
but we, and we entertain and play with the thing that killed him. We have to stop doing that and say, Lord, I want to grieve for the things that grieve you. I want to feel the pain for the things that hurt your heart. You wept. I want to weep with you, Jesus. You know, that's being led in right. That's righteous, man. And I want to rejoice in the things that please your heart. I want to sacrifice and lay down my life and die to self, Jesus, just like you did. I want to give over my will and my soul, everything for you, Lord. I want to follow after you. I want to be like Paul that considered all the things of this world lost. They were rubbish in comparison. He said, I consider the present sufferings not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed. It's like this heart that just says, Lord, it's all about you. That's all the voice of the Holy Spirit talking to Paul. Because he was listening. He was listening. The Holy Spirit is talking to you, I am telling you. He's been speaking to you. You're ignoring him, and he is painfully redundant, isn't he? He just keeps on talking, echoing, and he's he's not going to let you move forward. It's like the Israelites. We're going to keep going full circle until you deal with this. You're not crossing over the Jordan in the Spirit-filled life and really walk in the power of the Spirit. you got to stop the grumbling. you got to stop the gossip. you stop, got to stop thinking that God's some type of genie or Santa Claus. He's your God. You need to follow after him and trust him over yourself. And one day, 40 years later, they decided to walk with God. And they crossed over in the Spirit-filled life, listening to his voice. They repented of all those things. God had to wipe out the generation that wouldn't repent. You know, the Holy Spirit's calling you. So he convicts of sin, of righteousness, and I love this one. It says, of judgment. Verse 11, because the ruler of this world is judged. Glory. Judgment. There is no judgment upon me. The Holy Spirit constantly is telling me, The judgment is done, and the enemy has been judged. Death has no sting any longer. And as a Christian, when I'm listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, I know all my sins have been removed. I know that Satan is roaring lion with no teeth. I'm not worried. You know, Christians are run around in fear of judgment, in fear of opposition, in fear of the enemy. And and the voice of the Holy Spirit is talking to you. He reminds you of your future. And he's also reminding you here clearly of Lucifer's future too, right? And why is that so important as a Christian? Because as I'm walking with the Lord and I'm walking under persecution, all these things, I'm going, judgment's been removed from me. I'm a child of the Most High God. His spirit bears witness in me that I have nothing to fear. If God be for me, who can be against me? And when Satan comes at me to try and speak lies against me, I can just remind him where he's going, right? He's going to the smoking section. I'm going to the non-smoking section. (laughs) Amen? It's like it's a done deal. So when the Holy Spirit's talking to you, you know you have that peace about the future. When someone's listening to the voice of God, you don't worry about tomorrow. Why would you if God's told you he's got it covered, right? And yet we do, don't we? (laughs) <laughs> we do closing the scripture out look at this verse 13 however when the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and tell you things to come he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you i want you to write these things down i got three things that says the holy spirit does here one he guides our path He reveals our future, and he glorifies the Son. The first thing he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide your path. He is going to be like the Isaiah 30 that we read. It was, you're going to hear a voice behind you telling you to go to the right or the left. I am telling you, whenever you come to a situation as a child of the Most High God, that you can go, Lord, what do I do here? And a voice is going to come and tell you and guide you. Every time. Should I work here, Lord? He's He's going to tell you. Should I marry this person, Lord? He's going to tell you. Lord, I'm concerned about what's going to go on here, you know, with, with the finances. Is, is everything going to be okay, Lord? Yes. It's going to be, thank you, Lord. And a peace. He speaks through a peace, right? Psalms 85, a peace and a truth. And he comes and he guides you. We need to be a people, like Paul said, praying without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We're just like always talking, driving down the road. And he just wants to talk to us and tell us. Do you think you could be lost driving down the road? Lord, I'm lost. 
can you be the gas station attendant for me, Lord? Which way to go? You think he would tell you? You betcha. Now, he might want you to stop over and talk to a gas station attendant and share the gospel, though. <laughs> but my point being is, he's always wanted to give us answers. There's so many times where I, got, I, I don't mean to get to, you know, psycho, you know, type of network, psychic network type thing here, but, you know, there's times where I just go, Lord, I can't find my keys. Now, Lord, can you just put my mind where I put those? Because I have an appointment here, and they're waiting on me, and something comes to my own, it's right there. Now, you might go, oh, that's just coincidence, Dave. I don't believe that. I believe God's talking to me, and he's telling me things. He'll tell me where the little toy $5 doggy is. <laughs> right? He'll tell, he cares about the little things. He cares about everything. You know, Lord, I'm having problems in this relationship. Can you lead and tell me how to resolve this? What's the best way to go about it? And he'll tell you what to do. So he leads and guides you. And then the next thing I should write down is he reveals the future. It says he will tell you things to come. Verse 13, the last part of the verse. Wait a minute. He's going to tell me things to come? Does God tell us things that are futuristic? You betcha. It even says in Acts chapter 2 that in the last days, people will dream dreams and have visions. I mean, God speaks to people. He will tell you prophetic things before they happen. I've had people go, you know what, Dave, I saw, I, I actually saw a picture of my spouse before I met them. I had a dream. Seriously. God does stuff like that. Now, it's not that we chase after that. We don't chase after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow after us as we believe the word of God, right? You, when it talks about the function of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't talk about a bunch of angel dust falling from heaven and all this stuff. And this is the function of the Holy Spirit, right? Some people get off key of what the Holy Spirit's about. We're reading it. It's about convicting us of sin. It's about leading us in righteousness. It's about him guiding us. It's about him revealing the future to us. This, just like he was doing with his disciples. Jesus was telling them of things to come. He said the Holy Spirit's going to come, and all those are sons of God. He's going to do the same thing. I want you to have the insight to the future. We should be praying and saying, Lord, I want to be a person of vision. For without vision, your people perish, right? So I want to be a person that has insight to see things before they happen. Now, you might think that's too esoteric and spiritual or Pentecostal. That's what I'm reading right here. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. His voice, the voice of truth, the truth, is going to lead and guide you and reveal things before they happen. You don't have to be a prophet. You just have to be a Christian who listens to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't happen on command, okay? He's sovereign. We're not. We don't dictate to God how he does things. I'm grateful for that. But it's a matter of that we wait on him, Psalms 85. He's waiting on us to wait on him. Get that? Come on, don't zone out on me. This is important. I know we're going a little long this morning, but sink your teeth into this. It's going to change your life if you'll apply it, like everything. God says, I'm waiting on you to wait on me so I can speak to you. I want you to hear my voice. I want you to hear my voice in such a way it tells you to go to the right or go to the left, and you are led by me. I want you to hear my voice where you know things that are going to happen before they even take place. And then he says the Holy Spirit will also look at this last part here. It says, verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare to you. The last thing it says, the Holy Spirit is here to glorify the Son. So he's here to guide us. He's here to show us things before they happen. He convicts us in righteousness. And he's here to glorify the Son. How? By imparting to us all things that belong to the Son. Wow. I don't know about you. That's my favorite. Can we read that again? The Holy Spirit, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things, I like that, all things that the Father has are mine. So Jesus just declared himself God, didn't he? This is prior to the ascension. Some people say he wasn't fully God until the ascension. No, he was fully God and fully man. 
And he says, all things of the Father, we're one and the same. Equal in value, different in function. All things of the Father have our mind. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is here to speak to you and impart all the promises of God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing, Jesus said it. You ask anything in my name and declare it in my name, in my character. That means, listen closely, that's not a buzzword or a formula to get what you want to get lest some want to use it for. It means this. It means as I listen to the voice of truth and are led by the Holy Spirit and convicted in a road of righteousness, that means then I am living the character of Jesus. And so now what I ask will be according to his heart and his desire, aligned with his perfect will, and man, it will happen. It will happen. That's incredible. Jesus said, I've given you authority to bind and to loose, to announce and proclaim what is holy and what is unholy, to bless, to curse. We have been given the authority of Jesus Christ here on earth. Do you get what a big deal this is? This is massive, huge. We use about that much of our brain, right? I'm here to tell you we lose, use less of the capacity we have in spiritual power and authority. We're so busy looking at the book of Acts and going, oh, back then, healing sickness, raising the dead, prophecy, thousands being saved. Well, back in the day, it was really, well, it's because we're going back in the day. It's not like that way. We need to be a people that step up and go, I'm going to stop worshiping the good old days and be inspired by the good old days to make this the good old days, right? And be a people to go, I can hear God just like the Apostle Paul did. I know some of you might be going, oh, heresy. Why? Why is that heresy? Did God love Paul more than he loves you? Did Paul have more of the Holy Spirit than you? Was Paul more obedient than you? Probably. Yeah. So yielding to the voice of righteousness is the key to walking in this authority where the Son is glorified in you. You see the chain of events? Convicted of sin, I get saved. Get that? Got to start there. I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and righteousness, and I'm walking as Jesus walked. And then I'm not, I'm not praying in Jesus' name. I'm living in Jesus' name. And then I'm under the conviction that the judgment has been removed and Satan has no power over me in Jesus' name. I'm listening to the voice of truth. And as I'm listening to that voice, now I've got my own personal guide here on planet Earth. He's guiding me, he's leading me, he's telling me to go to the right or the left. He is revealing future things that just cause me to go, this is not my home, this is linear time, I belong in eternity, I see things before they happen, it's incredible, Papa, thank you. And the Son is being glorified because I'm hearing and experiencing all the treasure I have that's kept in heaven. I'm experiencing a lot of it here on earth. This is amazing, Lord. And I'm walking this intimacy with you where it's it's developing, where it's not just hearing something subconscious of right or wrong, peace or lack of peace. That's the training wheels of hearing the voice of God. Peace, no peace. Grief, joy. Those are the training wheels of hearing the voice of God. And if you'll abide in going, peace, yes. No peace, no. Grief, I curse that. Joy, I bless that. And we do that, all of a sudden, the training wheels come off of hearing the voice of God. Are you catching this? I'm getting goosebumps. This is good. (laughs) Seriously. I'm praying just a couple grab this today and run off with it. And so you got the training wheels off, and now all of a sudden, you're walking in more where God is actually giving you, all of a sudden you get a burden for India. And all of a sudden you see faces in India and he says, I'm called you to be a missionary there. All of a sudden you get this burden on your heart where he says, I've called you to be an evangelist. I've called you to be a pastor. I've called you to be a teacher. I've called you to be a servant. And I've called you to clean toilets in my name. And he, and he starts speaking to you and giving you specific visions and things like that. And you're going, this is awesome, Lord. And then you yield to that. And he's guiding you. And in the midst of that obedience, he starts getting deeper with you. And now it gets really prophetic. Now he starts talking about things to come. Words of knowledge about people's lives that the only way you could know it would be God. Blows your mind. Do you see the process? 
first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I mean, can you imagine if a brand new believer was walking in the depths of intimacy and revelation the Apostle Paul was? Couldn't do it. I mean, the Apostle Paul says, hey, because the great surpassing revelation is given to me, it was giving me a, a thorn in my flesh that I might not become conceited. Because when we get all these supernatural things happening in our life, we can start to think more of ourselves than we should. So it's a process. Some people never grow up. It's called spiritual arrested development. They never grow up. Seriously. And they never learn to hear the voice of God. And they rely upon a book and other teachers and never on the Holy Spirit who lives inside them. Because they don't want to be obedient. They don't want to follow his voice. And so they never grow up. And then the people who do, they look at them and go, oh, they're one of those left-wing liberal Pentecostal wackos. And don't get me wrong, there are those out there, absolutely. But I'm just saying, it's really just, you're just kind of using a scapegoat to not be challenged in your rebellion. You see what I'm saying? Guys, we need to be a people that say, Lord, whatever you say, I will follow. You are the voice of truth. I will follow. I am not going to listen to any other voice beginning with my own voice. There are fiery darts of other voices, and they will use Scripture to confuse you. Satan tried to talk to Jesus, and he used Scripture to try and confuse him with Scripture. Satan knows the Bible. So just because you hear a Bible verse doesn't mean that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. That's why we check the context of things, right? So we want to test everything by the Spirit of God in the context of the Word. And we, go, and we do that and we apply it. I am telling you, you will graduate whatever grade you're in. And you will go deeper to hearing the voice of your Father. And you'll get to a point where you'll wake up in the morning and you'll hear him go, my child. And you'll hear him say, Samuel. He'll call you. You'll be driving down the road and you'll hear a song coming on talking about the love of God and you'll hear a voice inside you saying, my child, I love you. And you'll weep. You'll weep, you'll laugh. You'll find healing. His voice heals. It sets free. And he's talking and he wants you to hear him. Will you wait upon him? Will you take the time Will you get up early and don't run out the door and go get in a room and get on your face and throw your heart out before God? Will you even now as we close in a song to, this morning and just say, Lord, I want to offer my heart to you. I'm not worried about my schedule today. I'm not worried about anything else. I want to seek you and I want to wait upon you, Lord. And I want to hear you. I want to hear your voice. How do I know whether that word, I love you, is me making it up in my head or it's really the Holy Spirit? How do I know? Your spirit will bear witness. There will be a peace. Something will happen. You'll go, this is supernatural. Family of God, I pray that the Father would help us to be a people who would be quick to listen and quick to obey where he's calling us to go. And if we'll do that, we'll become a supernatural people like what we read in the book of Acts. In his bank, in his economy, we already are. We're just not releasing it like we need to. So I want you to know I'm right there with you. I'm far from where I need to be in my walk with Jesus. I need to follow after him with much more of my heart. I want a much clearer ear to hear his voice. I want to see more of his power flowing through my life. I want to walk like Jesus walked, don't you? So what do you say we do it together? Can we do that here at this fellowship? Can we be a light in Lake Worth and Palm Beach County and be a church, not the best church, not the one that has it all together, just one and be faithful with the charge given us where we can be a powerhouse for God where people come in here and they're so convicted of their sin that they repent or they run? Where lukewarm Christians come in and they're going, I can't live the lame lukewarm life I used to and be here because I stick out like a sore thumb. Can we be a body like that? Let's commit that to prayer today. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. As we close in prayer, guys, you know what? We're going to hold off on, on that last song. We're going to just go ahead and be still before the Lord and uh, do something a little different this morning. Before we do close in prayer, I want to say to anyone here today that hasn't come to that place where you've yielded to the voice of the Lord, say, believe and trust in me. If you haven't done that, it's real simple. Right where you're standing, you can say, Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, I trust in what you did on the cross for me. You can do that right now. And if you're going to do that today, don't leave without talking to one of the leaders here, one of the pastors, and say, hey, I just want to tell you I'm trusting in Jesus. You could turn to your neighbor you're sitting next to today and say that to them. 
But specifically today, I want to minister to the body of Christ in this time of prayer. And I want to take a few minutes and I want to wait upon him. We're going to open our hearts. We're going to close our eyes, closing off things to the world. And I want you just to take time just to say, Lord, speak to me. Wait upon him to speak to your heart. Thank you. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart I will be found by you says the Lord and I will bring you back from your captivity Father we thank you that you are a God that thinks about us you are a God that waits upon us to cry out to you So, Lord, we want to turn over the affections of our life, our daytimer, all our desires, and we want to lay them at your feet today. And we want to turn, Lord, from a desensitized walk with you. We want your voice, God, to be so clear. So, Father, forgive us for not listening. Lord, we're sorry we've ignored your voice. To thank you, God, the king of all the universe, longed to speak, and we would rather listen to the TV instead. We've been deceived, Father. We've been deceived. We want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that the judgment has been removed and Satan's power has been removed. We thank you that we have freedom to run in the arms of our Father and listen to his voice. Thank you. We ask, God, that you would help us as a people in these last days to be an army that is quick to listen to you and quick to follow after you. We ask, God, that you would steal over the affections of our heart for the things that please you and glorify you. And if there's any area, Lord, may you speak to us, any area that's holding us back, anything that needs to be confessed, any rebellion and walking down a road you told us not to, Lord, we want to turn from that and follow after you. Pick up our cross and walk. We can only do it, Father, with the strength you've given us and you've already given it to us. So we desire, Father, to rededicate our soul, our mind, and our body to you. We're asking that you would baptize us afresh in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. May we overflow with an anointing that would teach us and lead us and guide us. May your voice direct us, Lord, up, down, backwards, and forward. We want to follow after you with all that's within us, Father. So, God, we dedicate this prayer to you when we're believing, even this week, that there's going to be intimate moments as we wait upon you. We're going to hear you like we've never heard you before. 
where your word will come alive in a way we've never read it before. Father, we're committing this to you and thank you that you have given us all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And every saint shouted. Amen. <laughs> Family of God, God bless you. Thanks for coming out.